Okay, so good evening and welcome to Norfolk County Council's launch of LoRaWAN, the long range wide area network. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Martin. I'm part of the digital skills team at Norfolk County Council. Just going to take a couple of moments just to run through what to expect over the next 60 minutes in this session. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to run through and explain the concepts and the benefits of LoRaWAN and how that works. And there's a multitude of ways in which it can work, both for private sector and business and for the community as well. And um, we've got some key speakers in order to run through what their vision of uh, Norfolk's digital looks like. And we've also got some um, some experts, some senior people from IMT, from IT Norfolk County Council, just to put some meat on the bones and explain how it works and give you some real user case examples as to um, how the LoRaWAN network is being used right now across Norfolk and Suffolk. And what we're hoping that it does is take people's thinking, take your thinking in different directions as to the multitude of different ways that you've got the possibilities of using the network that's available to you. Um, so just before we kind of move on with the content, um, we'll have a Q&A session at the end and just by way of um, explanation about the Q&A, um, you'll have a, probably have a Q&A sidebar on your on your um, view at the moment. Um, if you can't see that sidebar of the questions and answers for you to type any questions that you've got as we go into, um, there'll be an icon on your screen with a little question mark in it. If you click on that, it will open up the sidebar and you'll see very clearly at the bottom of that. Um, type your name and your question as we go. Uh, and if we can answer them as we go, we will. If not, what we'll do is we'll round off by having a Q&A session at the end. So um, what we'll do is we'll hand over, what I'll hand, do now is hand over to um, Andrew Proctor, who's the leader of Norfolk County Council. He's got a few words to say about kind of digital vision of Norfolk. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Martin, and uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Innovation Network launch event. A couple of years ago, both Tom Fitzpatrick and I spoke at the Internet of Things conference in Norwich. I said then that Norfolk is a smart county. It is, but it's also becoming a well-connected county. We've come a long way in those two years. Technology has actually got simpler, at least in my view it has, anyhow. In May last year, the County Council launched Together for Norfolk, our six year business plan for the county. That plan is a key message we wanted to get across. By working better together, we can all achieve more for our county. I'm pleased to say that approach is working and progressing well. This year has been pretty tough for all of us, but dealing with COVID has shown that working together is important in so many ways. We've seen neighbourhoods and communities come together. More than ever before, we've worked better with our colleagues in district councils. The NHS, the police, charities and other organisations on a common purpose to support those in need. It's a clear fact that we're stronger and more effective when we support each other. By doing that, we'll improve lives and prospects for people in the county. An essential element of everything we've done in the last six months has been the increased use of technology. We've all become accustomed to virtual meetings and virtual events as well, much like this one. And that's going to continue for some time to come. So where we are at the moment is in a situation where innovation is more important than ever. Our IT team, headed up by Director Jeff Connell and Chief Technical Officer Kurt Freire, we will hear from later this evening, are leading the way nationally on this front. Today you'll hear about the Innovation Network. This provides unprecedented opportunities for individual small and medium sized businesses just like yours. Infrastructure is vital to progress. By putting in place the infrastructure in the way we are, we're taking a big part of the cost out of the occasion, out of the equation for you. We want Norfolk to be a place that stands out with impressive, inclusive growth. A county that leads the way with strong infrastructure and connectivity. This network is another step towards that. It's also another way to engage in that dialogue with you, the wider business community. I'm really looking forward to seeing how businesses like yours can benefit from this technology as we continue to work together for Norfolk and achieve our collective ambition. From what you will see and hear this evening, I hope you agree that something exciting is happening in Norfolk and Suffolk. 
I'll now pass over to Councillor Tom Fitzpatrick, our Cabinet Member for Innovation, to talk a little bit more about the network itself and our ambition for connectivity in the county. Thanks for listening and over to you, Tom. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, as Andrew mentioned, I'm Cabinet Member for Innovation and Transformation, and um, he's also mentioned the excellent team we have at Norfolk um, in the IMT, and we've really done a lot over the past few years. Um, some of you might be familiar with the work we're already doing for you across the county. We're doing it for you both as residents and as businesses. We're working towards our ambition, a shared of ambition of making Norfolk the best connected rural county in the UK. We're doing it together for Norfolk. So the question is, why are we trying to achieve this ambition? We're trying to do it because we want to be a smart county. We want to be in a position where we're making better decisions based on real time dynamic information and connectivity is the essential foundation and we need to achieve that. We already have a network in place across the region supporting public services. We're delivering full fibre to parts of the county that's never had it before. In some cases, hardly got broadband and we're getting broadband to many more people than had it even five years ago and through the Better Broadband for Norfolk project. And we're working with our mobile network operators to improve mobile coverage, working with them. And that's the essential thing. Everything we're doing, we're working with people, not against them, working in partnership. Because all of these things are required to allow people to do business, good business and innovative business in Norfolk. So the Norfolk and Suffolk Innovation Network then, it's our next step in making Norfolk, together with Suffolk, the most connected rural county. And we're doing it to help make sure that we can stay at the forefront of innovation. And Andrew mentioned um, the IoT conference in Norwich. And I have to say, it doesn't really seem that it was actually less than two years ago that we stood in that stage at St Andrews Hall in Norwich, at the Internet of Things, October 2018. And what we saw then from the presentations and found out by listening to the speakers was the real capacity for the Internet of Things, an innovation network such as the one we're launching tonight. The innovation helps change things across the world by linking devices, things, the Internet of Things, and producing something dynamic linked together in a network, a network of connected devices. And I really want to make a point that's hugely important Norfolk is one of the pioneers of this technology. The network we're launching today is bigger and it's more advanced than anywhere else in the UK. And we've done that in less than two years. And at that conference in Norwich a couple of years back, Norfolk County Council sponsored a challenge and we said we'd work with the winner to put their ideas into action. And sometimes people think local authorities are slow to react. Well, I think we proved them wrong. The winning team proposed using heat sensors and highways, smart sensors, so that they could, we could monitor local temperatures and ensure that gritting lorries went out when and as needed. That could potentially save a lot of money and it could also save lives by getting them up, getting them up and running quickly. So the trial was up and running before Christmas. So that was something fast, relatively low cost and innovative. So less than two years later, we've gone from nothing to have an innovation network, which is, as I said again, and it's worth emphasizing, the largest in the UK. And the reason we've invited all of you along here tonight is because we want you on board. We want to kickstart and encourage innovation in this county, support your business, and we want you to be part of something big. So, exciting times exciting technology but before i go any further i'd like to thank suffolk county council and the new anglia local enterprise partnership for working with us to get this up and running and be able to get it into your hands um, suffolk will be holding their own launch for business and if you um in their county so if you work across the borders reach out to them as well so just in case you hadn't realized that i'm personally pretty excited about the network and its opportunities I worked in IT and changing business and organisations for many years. I just don't intend to say just how long and how many years, but we were doing smart working and before it was called that. So over the years, I've seen how technology can make a real difference. 
I've watched them arrive, personal computers, laptops, tablets, smartphones, phones that have more technology than took people on the moon mission all those years ago. And what do they do? They all connect people. And I can remember those dim and distant days of persuading people that they really ought to have a computer in their desks because people were very reluctant to do that. But um, technology does so much. It brings a chance for people in remote areas to interact, interact with people in cities, to bank, it lets everyone bank, shop, and lets everyone take advantage of what's available, not just the select few. It brings a level playing field of opportunity to everyone. It gives opportunity to children, no matter their background, um, sharing knowledge, sharing knowledge across the world, breaking down barriers, sharing opportunities, finding about jobs, educational courses, open to all. Things like online courses, absolutely amazing what's available, finding out about the world, finding out about what we have in common, but also giving us the chance to re-engineer things, to change process, processes, to automate the drudgery and make jobs more interesting. And then use technology to feed people, to keep in touch and share ideas. So I'm very excited about what we've seen from the network and some big industry leading businesses already using it to do some clever things. And it's something that's really only limited by our vision, my vision, your vision. So let's think about some of the things that are possible. Smart cities, smart street lights, parking, um, on and off lights, more um, social care, keeping an eye on young people, old people to make sure they're safe. Agriculture, tracking vehicles, monitoring what's happening in fields. And you're going to hear a bit more about what's happening in agriculture lately, um, later on because it's happening in Norfolk already. And we've also started using the network across our council services, hooking up sensors to measure all sorts of things already saving us money and giving us some really useful data to help us provide services most, more intelligently and efficiently. So it's already beginning to shape future investment. It's raising the profile of Norfolk on a national level and as well as further afield. But what I really want to say to you is this network can help your business, it can help it innovate and it can help it grow. We've built the network, so we're asking you to come and use it and we'll help you try this for yourself and you can try it without breaking the bank. So sign up with us and work together with us and be part of something big. So before we hear from Kurt Freire to explain a bit more about the network, its great opportunities and how you can get involved, I'm going to pass over to Madeleine Cook from the New Anglia Local Enterprise Partnership, who have provided the all important funding for this groundbreaking work. So Madeleine, over to you. Thank you very much, Tom. So for those of you that don't know, my name is Madeleine Coop. I'm the Innovation Manager at New Anglia Local Enterprise Partnership. We were established by government in 2010 and we're in unique business led collaboration between the private, public and education sectors across Norfolk and Suffolk. And we represent one of the fastest growing regions in the country with 1.6 million people and around 61,000 businesses. Our ambition is to drive economic growth and transform the local economy into a global centre for talent and innovation. So as we look to achieve those ambitions, we want to do all that we can to create the right environment to nurture innovation and support those with the vision to create step changes in business, industry and public services. So I'm really delighted to be here tonight at the launch of the Norfolk and Suffolk Innovation Network, as this exciting project speaks to the very heart of the region's ambitions, a place where high growth businesses with aspirations choose to be, a place which is well connected and where we collaborate to grow. And then we're going to hear from businesses later about how they're already using this important piece of infrastructure to explore and exploit IoT technology. And I know that the innovation network will be transformative. But for me tonight, I'd really like to talk about collaboration, as this project isn't only about digital infrastructure and the way we use data. It's also about innovation, and we all know that collaboration is an important building block of innovative economies. And this project has truly been a collaborative enterprise, and I congratulate all those that have made it a reality. Firstly, since its inception, collaboration has been central to its success. Across the two counties of Norfolk and Suffolk, the Innovation Network is a great example of local authorities working together in partnership for the benefit of business. 
And secondly, this initiative has the potential to support new interactions, new networks and new opportunities. And now more than ever, we need a strong and supportive innovation ecosystem which can bring together education, public sector, research and business expertise to create collaborative communities of innovative thinkers, helping us to build back better. In the current climate, digitization will be key to business growth and the Internet of Things will enable the opening of so many doors. The innovation network will allow, allow even the smallest of companies to benefit and use the technology across the whole of our two counties, with rural businesses able to access, access new opportunities too. So it's really exciting. And what strikes me about this project is the sheer breadth of opportunities it can unlock, from supporting entrepreneurs to test and realise their ideas, to creating an environment where agri-tech businesses can thrive, and working with school children to foster the next generation of innovators. There's no end to the potential now the supporting infrastructure is in place. So I'm really looking forward to hearing a bit more later on in the evening about how organisations are already making use of it. This project is funded through New Anglia Lex growth deal with government. Since 2014, we've secured £290 million, which by 2021 will have created an estimated 54,000 new jobs and generated an additional £628 million in public and private investment. Over the past 18 months, we've made significant capital investments in innovative projects, including four and a half million towards Productivity East at the University of East Anglia, which will deliver new regional hub for engineers, digital technology and management. We've also invested six million in the Digitech factory at City College Norwich, developing the facilities for convergent courses of digital tech engineering design. Helping to turn leading edge research into commercial reality, we've also provided support for many businesses, our Growth Hub has supported more than 9,000 businesses and helped to award nearly 30 million in grants. We've recently launched our Growth Through Innovation um, grant scheme, supporting businesses to undertake R&D projects with grants of up to £25,000. And through our co-investment fund, New Anglia Capital, we've seed funded the commercialization of research into electric vehicle systems, new diagnostics for cattle disease and online education resources, to name but a few. And it's through collaboration that we're really going to realise our collective ambitions for the region. And I know that this project is going to kickstart so many new partnerships and opportunities. I'm really excited to see. So I'm going to hand over now to Kurt Frary, who's going to be introducing the network and, and telling us how it's all, all going to work. So Kurt, over to you. Thank you, Madeline. I'm very pleased to be here today to talk about this uh, this project, which has uh, taken up a lot of my time because it's so important to the to the both the counties. Um, so I'm proud to launch today the largest free public sector Lorawan network in the UK. It's an innovation network. It's to help businesses and kickstart innovation in Norfolk and Suffolk, and it will make a difference to business in Norfolk and Suffolk. It it's, can be used by the public sector, it can be used by small businesses, it can be used by large businesses, it can be used whether you're a startup business. It will teach digital skills, it will encourage innovation just generally to solve some of the problems and challenges we have in the region. But what is it? What is it? It is a network of sensors. So if you wanted to uh, monitor the temperature across the region, across either of the counties, and you want to know what temperature it was all across the region, a sensor could collect that data, but you wouldn't have to send someone to collect the data. It would all automatically send it across the internet. So let's have a look at some of these sensors. You could help people live independently longer in their homes. You can monitor whether they've taken their pills. You can monitor buildings with it. You can have sensors in buildings that tell you whether someone's sitting at a desk or not. In the current climate, with some of the COVID um, restrictions and, and distancing we need to put in place, it could monitor that. It could monitor people at museums or in tourism on the broads. It can, it can tell us lots of things, effectively making us a smart county. It can help with transport. You could have sensors telling us where the traffic's flowing, where the traffic's not flowing, where, the, where it shouldn't be going. It can also help with agriculture. It can tell us what the air quality is. It can help us monitor uh, livestock and animals. It can also help us with safety concerns. So if we had an electric fence and it wasn't working, it can tell us about that. So 
as you can see, it's all about sensors and the term Internet of Things you may have heard of or IoT. Well, these are things, sensors, low cost sensors that collect small amounts of data that can send it across the Internet so we can make sense of it. We can use it on the broads. We can monitor boats, water levels, flooding, all of those things. We've even got a live trial at the moment in Gresnell Rural Life Museum to monitor where people are going to look at the exhibits. So it's all about sensors, thousands of them. Now we've put the network in to enable businesses to either create these sensors, use these sensors, or provide information from these sensors. A new opportunity, whether you're a small business, a commercial organization already delivering services, or you've just simply got some new ideas you want to uh, try and prototype and exploit, but the network will allow you to do that. So what it is is sensors, thousands of them send an information, small packets of data to gateways. Now the network is these gateways. We've rolled out these gateways across the region and I'll talk more about that in a moment. But these gateways will send the data to the internet where you can have dashboards. So you can imagine a sensor in, in the gritting example we've got, if we want to know what the temperature is uh, in Great Yarmouth, we've got sensors in the road, literally monitoring already the temperature there and it sends it to a deck gateway. 25 miles away a county hall to the internet to a dashboard so then we can monitor the actual temperature uh, automatically dynamically so the technology it uses is called LoRaWAN which stands for long range wide area network but in, in simple terms what it is is like a mobile phone network it's radio it sends data very long distances very low power um, and very small packets. So you can't make a mobile phone call on it. You can't browse the internet, but what you can do is regularly sense things happening, whether it's in people's homes, whether it's in, in the wider county, whether it's on a farm, and actually collect, send that data and collect it without sending someone there. So you can actually collect all this information and use it to inform decisions. So where is the network? Well, this map of Norfolk shows uh, a load of blue circles and one purple one, and they're where all the gateways are already. So we're already about 50% of the way through the project in Norfolk. The network's already there. If you're a local business and you want to get involved, uh, I'll tell you how to get involved in, in a bit, but you can use the network today. And we've already got businesses using the network. We've got small fledgling businesses using it, and we've got commercial organizations who've been around for many years who are now embracing this new technology to transform their services, to help farmers monitor their crops. And we'll hear about that in a minute. But so far, we've rolled out 50 gateways in Norfolk. We're going to roll out 110 gateways over the next few months, so a total of 110 plus 25 internal gateways, which we'll put in business business locations and business parks. So the network's going to be twice the size of what it is. But to give you some idea of, of the coverage of the network that you can use for free, whether you're a member of the public, public sector or a private business, um, here's another map of Norfolk. Now I've put a, a, a web address on there, ttmmapper.org. For anybody in the audience, if you want to see anywhere in the world where this technology is available and specifically Norfolk or Suffolk, if you type that into your browser and have a look right now, you'll be able to see live where the coverage is. Now on this diagram here, we've got these large purple circles around a central point. Central point is where the gateways are, where we've already installed them for the network. And the circle round there is where we've had a sensor connecting to that gateway. So if we look at Great Yarmouth here, you can see it goes almost all the way to Norwich and the Norwich ones goes all the way to Yarmouth. So that is data being collected automatically 25 miles away. Now, this, these purple circles show that we've pretty much covered all of Norfolk. Um, however, we want to put more gateways in to make the network more resilient. So a, a sensor will talk to one or more gateways, but also to ensure where we've got some spots where we need better coverage, we will put that in. And we'll talk more about that in, in a minute. Um, however, there will be 110 gateways in Norfolk, 110 in Suffolk, 25 internal gateways in, in Norfolk and 25 in Suffolk. We're already leading the country on this. We've got the most coverage in the UK and other areas of the country are coming to us to ask us how we did it, how they can follow us. We're leading the way. So the network is the Norfolk and Suffolk Innovation Network. 
how you can get involved is to use sensors, buy sensors, support and infrastructure of sensors, providing dashboards and looking at your services that you may already provide or new services that you want to provide and use the network to help with that. But that's probably um, enough for me. Let, let's hear from some local local businesses and local public sector people who are already using the network because it's there now. So first of all, I'm going to introduce a video from Alex Cliff, who works for Norfolk County Council. He works in our highways department and he's already using the network for gritting. So I'm Alex Cliff, I'm the Highway Network and Digital Innovation Manager. I work for Norfolk County Council. My role is around the highway network and managing it, and also trying to use technology to improve the service that we deliver for Norfolk residents. So I first got involved with the, um, the use of the Innovation Network a couple of years ago, when I was trying to find solutions to our winter service delivery and trying to identify cost efficiencies that we could deliver. The sensors that we've deployed are looking at road surface temperatures in Great Yarmouth and Kinsinin to see whether there's any local variances in temperatures that we could use to optimise the, the winter service delivery. Following our successful trials of the technology so far, we have plans to roll this out even further to bring in more data to help make better decisions in the future, to really maximise the benefits that we can get out of the innovation network. The network is already out there and ready to use and with the support of local businesses is really easy to adopt at, at low cost. But we quickly realised that there were other use cases that we could use the network for, not just in highways but wider across the organisation as well. Some examples of how we think we can use the network in future include monitoring bridges for strikes from vehicles as well as monitoring air quality. The use cases are endless, I think. The sensors have been really beneficial to Norfolk County Council and it's really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we could do in the future. So that was a video of Alex. He's using low cost sensors to transform the way we deliver services in Norfolk County Council, in this case, Britain. Um, but let's hear from a commercial organisation. So um, we've got a video from Carl Pitlin, and, and who works for Ben Burgess, and David Wattoff, who works for Meetos UK. When they found out about the network, they embraced it and they're transforming their services already. My name's David Wattoff. I'm the Managing Director of Metos UK. We distribute pestle instruments who manufacture sensors, um, primarily for the agricultural sector. Hello, my name's Carl Pitlin. I work for Ben Burgess. So Ben Burgess, we are agricultural engineers. We're based here in Norfolk. The Innovation Network presents a wonderful opportunity for, for Norfolk and, and, and surrounding areas um, because being as it's such a rural county, there are many people in the rural community who, who could really benefit from cost effective uh, uh, connectivity into their lives. Specialising in the agricultural sector as we do, we can offer a sensor at a much, much more useful price point and encouraging growers to look at data in a much more granular fashion. But we can offer a LoRa sensor at the same price, they can have four or five units on their farm and that makes a huge difference. So we use the sensors, uh, we've deployed them out in the field. Our sensors are gathering rain and weather data uh, where we then feed that information back to the landowner or the potato grower in this instance where he can monitor his crops see what the weather he's had for them and use it for soil moisture to know how much irrigation he potentially needs to be giving to his um, crop or even using it for humidity for disease modeling and disease monitoring for crop protection. This technology presents a, 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 a real opportunity to deliver to the customers a, a cost effective decision support tool. It allows him to understand what's happening in the field remotely. It allows him to match that information with the day-to-day -day decisions he's got to make. Uh, we've got a reliable network. The, the signal, the systems, our weather stations are just out there ticking away, returning data every 15 minutes. You know, and then the customer's getting a, you know, a history of what's happened and the ability to be able to use that data to make better agronomic decisions and give a better return on investment for growing that crop at that particular time. For us, being involved with the Innovations Network was quite simple quite easy to install, easy to set up. After speaking to Kurt and Andrew with our 
Lorraine sensor. We just literally pitched up here outside County Hall at our, our depot at Norwich and uh, put a sensor out and it returned data straight to our website straight away. I mean, the Innovations Network being county-wide presents opportunities for every part of the, the Norfolk community. So not only at the agricultural sector, but also the amenity sectors. The whole opportunity is to, is to be able to, is to connect the county, but connect the county from grassroots levels and, and, and really make a difference. What is interesting about that is so far the, the videos we've seen, um, the businesses have got their solutions, prototypes up and running within a matter of weeks. Some of them have just only been four weeks. So the, the last video I want to, My name's David. to play is from Michael Price of Uniotech. Michael um, operates a small business located in Norwich and he has grown on the back of this network being installed. So let's hear from Michael. My name is Michael, I'm CEO of Uniotech. We make bespoke IoT solutions for businesses and local authority customers. We help people collect data from hard to reach places and make better decisions with it. So we've been working in the IoT space for a while and um, as Norfolk County Council began the, the rollout of their network, we saw opportunity to work with them. They had um, a series of uh, use cases that we could help with and it uh, turned out to be a great partnership. We've got a range of projects deployed on it from desk occupancy in office buildings right out to road temperature monitoring and footpath. So the network's been, been really great for us. Um, it's made our projects much more accessible. It really lowers the barrier to entry. There's no requirement to install expensive network infrastructure for a small scale project and you can provide coverage across the county. Adoption on a large scale is really beneficial for a lot of businesses. There's a huge range of, of applications for this kind of technology. It goes from um, farming, collecting detailed data about your, your fields and, and crops, uh, down to businesses, utilization of space, managing buildings, um, collecting air quality data. It's really um, endless applications and once you start collecting large amounts of data through these kind of technologies, you can start to make better decisions about how you um, deploy your services, how you run your business, and uh, what changes you can make to bring improvements to all of those areas as well. So getting up and running on the network was, was really easy. The technology is um, accessible, intuitive, and ideally suited to the kind of projects we were doing. When we worked with the council, they they were really keen to get involved in this as well. So, and that's been, been really beneficial for them collecting some interesting data about, about their services and utilization of that. And really great for us as well to get an insight into different project areas and how different organizations operate. So the network's really helped us to grow. Having the opportunity to access a county-wide network has been a real benefit for our customers. Um, and it's helped us to expand our team as well. So we've, we've created two jobs um, in the past year and there's expansion and team planned um, coming into the end of this year as well. So the work we've done um, with the Innovation Network has uh, influenced how we're, how we're moving forward with the business. So we've, we've had opportunities to work on a range of different projects and it's uh, really opened our eyes to some of the opportunities that are out there. We're now working with other businesses locally and internationally to develop some, some new products based on the, uh, the areas we've worked on locally in Norfolk. So we're going to continue our partnership with Norfolk County Council and help other local businesses to take advantage of the technology and create innovative solutions for their organisations. So I love that video because that's a local business, they're in business helping support the public sector and they're prepared to work with other businesses to help them with the technology. That's what it's all about. If we work together, we can do great things. So just to recap, it's uh, we've put the network in and it's still growing. Um, you can get involved. It's free to use. It will kickstart innovation in the region. If you've got an idea about how to put sensors in or you want to monitor something or you've got a service you think this could transform, it can do all of that. We've got proven use cases um, and we're not just talking about innovation. We're doing it. This has opened up the doors for business in the, in the both Norfolk and Suffolk. So come and get involved. So how do you get involved? Well, you can, if, if you're a business in Norfolk, you can contact us on in at norfolk.gov.uk. If you're a business in Suffolk, you can contact us on in at suffolk.gov.uk. 
Um, you can find out more because we'll also be at the Restart Festival, the Norfolk and Suffolk Restart Festival on the 30th of September. So if you go Google that, you'll find that. And we're, ho we're intending to um, host an event in October about all the different use cases. We've got some 70 on our books that we need to deliver or we want to explore. Um, and in November, we're going to hold a rev an event um, to share a bit about the technology so people can get up to speed on that. But the other thing I'd like to announce today is we've got a number of gateways still to roll out, as I said earlier. If you're a business in Norfolk and you would like to uh, use experiment with this technology and you've got a suitable building with Internet access, get into contact. We may be able to put a gateway on your building to help you with that and also show you how to set things up. So the offers there. Email us, contact us, come to Restart Festival, the Norfolk and Suffolk Restart Festival, or join one of the events. Look out for those in October and November. Or if not, scan the QR code, go to the, the digital site of norfolk.gov.uk slash digital and have a look and we'll, we'll share more as the, as the days progress. So that leaves me to, to say, look, these are low cost sensors. People have been prototyping things in the matter of weeks and they've got involved and it's made a difference. That could make a difference to you and your business. So come and get involved. I thank you all for, for listening. I think we've got to take some questions now. OK, thanks for that, Kurt. Uh, so we're going to hand over. We'll, we'll run through some questions if that's OK. We've had quite a few. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, um, I'll just uh, read out a few questions one by one and then direct them um, to the right people for answers, if that's OK. Um, I'm suspecting that quite a lot of these will be directed at um, Kurt specifically. Um, but uh, first question that we got here and we've got quite a few to, uh, to run through um, was if I don't have um, LoRaWAN coverage in my area, um, who, do, who does somebody contact to improve coverage? So I suppose it's a coverage type of question there. Yeah, so um, generally uh, it, it will depend on the sensor you've bought as well. So if you've got a sensor and you haven't got coverage, um, it depends on the aerial on there. But if you email us we'll, uh, with the postcode, we'll have a look for you. But you can also go to ttmmapper.org and just see what expected coverage should be in your area. OK, thanks for that. Uh, next question was um, when you say it's free to use, is it really free to use? Are there any transaction fees in the future to send data? So kind of uh, data charges, I suppose. Yeah, it's absolutely free to use. The idea of the network isn't um, it isn't to, to make any money out of it. It's to enable businesses to start and try new ideas. And one of the barriers to that in the past has been if you wanted to put a sensor somewhere, you'd have to pay a mobile network operator uh, uh, under a 12 month co contract a fee for that. This is actually free to use and we intend for it to stay free to use. OK, um, and while you're here, Kurt, is the network secure and are there any SLAs or service level agreements to guarantee uptime and availability? Yeah, the network is secure. The data that's transferred from the sensors is encrypted from the sensor to the network and then from from there to the final delivery point. Um, so, yes, it is secure to use. What was the second part of the question, Martin? Um, it was um, SLAs. To, are there any SLAs oh, in yeah. place to guarantee so, uptime? So no, we're not putting SLAs in place. The reason for that is it's a, it's a different type of network. Um, as you can see from the coverage maps, they all overlap. So the gateways overlap the signals. So if one gateway is down, you should still get a signal from another gateway. So it made sense. And, and, and that's part of the reason why we can make it free. If we were to put expensive SLAs around it um, and, and all of that, what, what comes with that, that would then force us to charge. And we don't want to do that. Now, if a, if a commercial organization like Ben Burgess is happy to use it and they find it reliable. I can't see why everyone else doesn't. OK, thanks for that. Um, and I suppose another question about cost, which is who pays for the sensors? Um, and, and then in particular, who would pay for the sensors? For example, on an EV charging point, there's a few EV type um, questions in there, but maybe if we could tie that into thinking about or uh, to talking about um, how LoRaWAN could help air pollution or air quality specifically, and then perhaps who pays for the sensors to answer two questions in one. Yeah, sh should we ask Michael Price to answer that? Because he's a business right at the forefront that's actually okay. building sensors and, and, and paying for them. 
Oh, yeah, so um, supplying the sensors, um, you can deploy them yourself. So if you've got a, a particular use case you want to, to do something for your business or at home, you can, uh, you can buy a sensor, they're fairly low cost, um, and get it set up yourself. Uh, if not for EV charging points, if you uh, if they're deployed by local authorities, perhaps the, the local council that are installing them would be interested in uh, providing a sensor for that. Um, or landowners, if they're going on to public car parks, it could be a real benefit for them to encourage people to, to come to the site to pay for the sensors as well to install them there. OK, thanks, Michael. Um, a question about um, having a professional dashboard. So if people were using LoRaWAN and the data was sent to them um, and they wanted to create a, a professional dashboard, is there any assistance to this or is that kind of up to the up to the user? I, I think that's another opportunity for businesses in the region because um, you may get a business that doesn't particularly want to do the electronics bit or the sensor bit, but they may want to get involved in creating dashboards and the, the web end to, to that or the mobile app because a dashboard could be on a mobile as well. So um, I, I think that is entirely up to the, the person who's who's got the idea that they're trying to work on. But it may be like if it's a public sector thing, I, I may be as a customer be saying to that business actually will do the dashboard or can you use Unio Tech or another so business can sell to business on this as well which makes it even more interesting okay thanks for that um i suppose again two two questions in one do you have a view as to um Kurt, as to how much sensors cost and where people can acquire them from yeah, that, that, that's probably best to give my view and give uh, Michael and um, and Carl's view and, and Alex's view, actually. Um, so sensors can range from as little as £10 for the sensor, and then you need a bit of electronics as well, 150 to several thousand, depending on what you're doing. So for instance, an air quality sensor, you can buy an air quality sensor, which isn't calibrated from China for five pounds. And then you need to connect that to some other other electronics to send the data. So you, you'd probably be looking at 50 pounds or so. However, you can buy industrial air quality sensors, which costs thousands of pounds. So it really depends on what you're trying to achieve and um, and what you're trying to what you're trying to prototype for a prototype i wouldn't spend much and we've had we, we've we've tried some of our prototypes and we've we spent 150 pounds on them so michael I, I don't know if you have a view on that yeah so as as kurt said there's a huge range of options available um we've deployed sensors from as little as 50 pounds for a, a device and the gps trackers we use are, are only 50 pounds and they're ready to go no configuration required at all and then as you, as you said, you can you can build bespoke solutions to problems that cost quite a lot more, and it's all down to what you're trying to measure the, the quality of the the sensor. So like a a temperature sensor can be very cheap, um, but if you want to do uh, particular like CO2 or um, nitrogen dioxide measurement, and it needs to be uh, parts per billion level to meet DEFRA standards, then those sensors, the actual device that does the measurement of the gas, is very expensive. The, the LoRaWAN aspect of it is quite cheap. So it, it's all about the, the accuracy of the sensor that you want to use as to how much it costs. But the vast majority of solutions can be delivered with a really cheap, low cost sensor. And while, while you're here, Michael, um, a quick question about uh, interference and, and safety. Um, uh, are the sensors safe or does it interfere with anything else like Bluetooth or any other Wi-Fi? Yeah, they're, they're very safe. Um, they operate on um, 868 megahertz, which is a, a license free band in the UK. So um, they don't interfere with uh, your Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or anything like that. They're in a separate separate bit that's reserved for um, industry and science and manufacturing equipment. So you're not going to have any issues with interference. The range on them is really good. The, the LoRa technology is designed to um, deal with interference from other devices and things as well. So it's got a, it's a really robust radio technology, which is why we can get such a good range. Um, I know some of the some of the testing we do, we've got sensors on the coast at, at Winterton and they get picked up by gateways in Amsterdam quite frequently. So it, it really is a, a long range um, and highly robust system that you can use. OK, I can see that Sally's asked a question about um, being a, a care firm and wanting to monitor arrival times of clients in order to space them out. 
Um, uh, so they might use LoRaWAN in order to do that and help the strain on, on any private transport that people might be using like taxis. Um, and that's kind of, and she's asking what would she need to do in order to use LoRaWAN in order to do that and perhaps stagger or measure arrival times of clients and visitors? I think there's um, several answers to that question, but genuinely I would say that um, you would need to work with a local business if, if you're not a business um, and, and maybe um, someone like Unio Tech or another business to say, look, this is what the, this is the problem I'm trying to fix. And then you can agree on what we've done in the past is agree uh, a spec for that. Ask the business to come up with a prototype to show us it working. Usually four to six weeks, you get that and you try it out, then you tweak it and then they develop in something, something more. Two things happen there. You get something, a new product that hasn't been uh, or is unlikely to have been used before. It's low cost, so you get to try it before you, you, you finally commit to a bigger spend. And also a local business gets to try developing that and providing a service based on there. Um, and then th there's other businesses that may be involved in terms of the, the booking system, or it may link into an existing booking system. Because I know, for instance, Alex, who was on the video earlier, um, he's uh, looking at um, getting the, the temperature data for gritting integrated into an ex existing system that they've already got. So there's lots of opportunities around there, but to get involved, you probably, if you're not a local, if you're not a business yourself, you need to probably get involved with a local business or contact us and we'll try and, try and make that link together with you. Okay, thanks Kurt. Um, there's a good question here from Councillor Kemp who's asking um, if we could just explain very briefly, um, if you're a small business and you're thinking about being involved in the Internet of Things and you don't really know how to get past any barriers to entry, how easy is it? just to get involved in using LoRaWAN or the Internet of Things? And have we got any practical examples of any real use cases that are going on at the moment? Yeah, that's probably best if Michael answers some of that. But first of all, I'll just talk about a few use cases we've already got that are live and running. So um, I touched on we've got Gresson Hall Rural Life Museum. We've, we've provided sensors to the to there um, so that they can hand them out to the public. So when they're walking around the museum, they can um, actually attract people to see which exhibits they go to, which ones are of value and which ones aren't of value, or do they actually find them all? Um, and and rural, at rural Gresson Hall, there's also a farm part to that. So it's an open air museum. Uh, many of you will be familiar with it, but um, we can also see how many people go down to the farm and down to the water. So that's a trial that's going on right now, and that seems to be working really well. It, it just it just worked off the bat. Um, we've also got, um, uh, we've worked with Union Tech to put some sensors into County Hall. This was pre-COVID to monitor people at desks. So not monitor the person, but to tell whether someone's sitting at a desk. So we could then start to see whether we could um, uh, um, uh, tell people where the free desks were who were working flexibly. And obviously that solution may, may or could be adapted now to help with the COVID situation. Um, so there's that. There's also, we've got temperature sensors at the old RAF called Shul called Scott now um, where we're monitoring temperature in the um, the temporary morgue we've got there um, to make sure that that's working well um, and we're clearly using them for the highways and gritting. Um, Michael do you want to talk about how easy that was to get up to speed with the technology and, and, and get involved? Yeah so actually using um, the network is really easy so you can go to the thingsnetwork.org to um, register your devices it's completely free sign up for an account on there um, there's a, a a good community around the things network where there's a lot of people have, have tried things before if you're looking at um, a, a particular project you want the forum for the things network's got loads of information on there they've got some really good tutorials as well on how to set up your devices and create links into other systems um, so yeah it's if you've got um, a little bit of it experience um, it's pretty straightforward to do, but we're we're happy to help out if you've got um, a problem you want to solve. Get in touch. We'll be more than happy to talk about options for it and uh, see what might work for you. OK, thanks. We've got a few more just to, to run through, but we've got we'll have an opportunity to have a discussion after this as well. If anyone wants to join in um, in, a, in a in a more verbal way, we can move to a meeting where you can um, talk to some of the presenters here. 
Um, a couple of other questions. Is there a maximum number of sensors than uh, sensors that network can support before congestion becomes an issue? No, that is the question. Um, there will be a maximum at some point, but it can support thousands. Each gateway can support loads and loads of sensors and um, obviously we'll be monitoring to see how things go. But as we're uh, leading the way on this, um, we we haven't had any uh, feedback from where they're using it widely in Europe um, where it's been a problem as such, because we're talking small packets of data and the network's uh, uh, intelligent in terms of if the sensors goes mad, sends too much data or isn't working properly, it will restrict its the amount of data it can send. So there are controls in place to stop that happening. And uh, along similar lines, I think that it's kind of almost uh, attached to that question, which is, um, Will the users of it or the monitors of it be able to ac access each other's sensors, sensors or will there be any duplication of sensors and how might we mitigate that if there is any crossover? Michael, do you want to have a go at that one? <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, we can help people um, share data between them. The, the Things Network um, system allows you to collaborate on projects. So there is a, a community group um, at the moment in, in Norfolk and Suffolk um, with groups of people that are very interested in doing this, working on various little projects. Um, it's possible to, to share data between them. You can also, um, when the data is received by the network, you can forward it on to a multiple um, different places. So you can have it go to different platforms and systems. I don't know, um, Norfolk County Council are very keen to to make some of the data uh, available as a public API as well to say so it's got benefits for everybody that we won't need to all be measuring um, air quality in every part of the county and if, if you have your own air quality sensor you'd be able to feed the data into a single platform and there's a whole load of not just Norfolk County Council systems there's a whole load of systems for, for things like air quality and pollution monitoring that are global networks that you can feed your data into and everybody can access it. Great, thanks for that. Um, is there any help that the NCC or Norfolk or Suffolk would offer, um, perhaps Kurt, to anybody who wants to learn how to make or deploy sensors? Yeah, so we, we've, we're planning these other events to help people both understand the network more and uh, the, the potential use cases that we're as, as a county council looking to to um, challenge businesses on, you know, could they help us with a particular business problem? So we've got this this event in October, which is we're going to talk about use cases and all the ones on the list. And there'll be other ideas that come out from the people in the audience today. Um, and then we've also uh, planning an event in November where we're going to talk through the technology to help people get involved. Um, hopefully, people like Michael will be joining us on that as well. To to uh, and and possibly um, uh, people from uh, Meetos. Or, or whatever, we will introduce other speakers to help with the understanding and get people kickstarted in their technology. But there's also resources online. So um, the thingsnetwork.org, as, as Michael's uh, already spoken about, you can go there and, and, and they've got some videos online for that. And we'll, we'll be doing a number of other events um, to, to help people with that. Of course, people can contact us directly as well and we'll point them in the right direction. Great. OK, um, somebody's making the point that some sisters come, some systems come like smart street lighting with already assistive tech, so they've all got pre-built sensors built into them. Um, have we seen or used anything on the network with any pre-built sensors that already come with the tech? I think that's quite a good question, that one. Um, th that might be one we want Carl to answer because Carl uh, and, and Ben Burgess, they already had some sensors but there was a higher cost for them to collect the data. So Carl, would you like to take that question? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll answer that one. So we were, or we are using um, weather stations to collect data. So we were using weather stations that were using SIM cards and recording, you know, having a cellular contract. Um, and then the network come available and Metos had the Lorraine sensor, the LoRa sensor available to us. So we see that as a, uh, a cost option. Um, it's a sensor that's got set or one sensor, sorry, five sensors within one unit. So we've got uh, air temperature, humidity, rain and leaf wetness all built into one sensor. So we see that as a good option to use this network 
And as you see from the video, we just simply deployed it out into the field, um, set it up. Yeah, it's got a solar panel on it to keep it charged. And it just instantly went straight into our own um, web uh, website. And then we've got a dashboard there, which we can view the data from either from a cell phone, a smartphone or from the laptop and instantly have access to our weather or the weather data that's going on from that sensor. And that gives us a great opportunity to reduce the costs of our um, weather stations and also deploy more across the uh, the agricultural area that we're trying to cover. So I hope that uh, gives a little insight into our sensor. Great. OK, thanks for that, Carl. Um, just a couple more questions, I suppose. Um, one of them might well have um, been answered just by Carl. It was about um, battery, how long the battery life might last on a sensor. Um, but you kind of intimated there that it was a uh, it was a solar powered. Um, so I don't know, Kurt, are most of the um, sensors solar powered? Well, I know they're uh, low power. Yeah, so, so um, when, when we're looking at the, these sensors, uh, it depends on how you're deploying them. Some, some, some people will want solar powered sensors just because of where they are located or they don't want to visit and change the battery. And it depends what you what how what you're sending, how often, how 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 often you want to send that data across the network. So I'll give you an example. If you have a people counter, you know, you're counting people going past, you want that to be working all of the time so it's consuming battery. Um, but you may not need to send the data every minute or every time you you count someone, you might only need to send it once a day. So then that won't have such a strain on the battery sending that data. However, it may use a lot of battery because you've got it on all the time counting. You may have a different type of sensor, say on a farm where you're monitoring the uh, the, the diesel level in a in a diesel container um, to see if it goes down, to see if it's been stolen or just so you know when to top it up. Now that may only be triggered when it hits a certain level. So that may only be run by battery and may only run, you know, may only be need to be replaced every five to ten years. So it depends on the sensor, it depends on the power it's using, it depends on the application. But it, obviously these sensors can be battery powered, solar powered, they can be wired in, there's all, all sorts of possibilities. OK, thanks for that. And, and perhaps um, coming to the end of the questions, um, Kurt, I don't know if you want to say something that someone's asked about a couple of times about the Things Network and is this using the Internet of Things Network or if it's connected at all or is it completely separate from that? Yeah, so um, we took the decision early on with this project to use the Things Network. So a very brief bit of history. When we when we first found about, out about this, because um, I attended the, the local hack space in Norwich, so where private individuals come together to share ideas about technology, about business, and all of those things. And while I was there, um, uh, they had representation from Microsoft and a load of uh, private individuals. And they were talking about this wonderful technology called Laura and the Things Network that was being used in Amsterdam, um, which was invented to monitor boats to see if they, would, they were sinking. Um, and that technology kicked off. And when they, they showed us the maps on TTM Mapper to show where the gateways were and, and the connectivity, Europe was covered and we had nothing in the UK, maybe in an odd gateway, absolutely nothing really. Um, so we started working with the community to, to see and explore the technology. We bought a gateway, put it on top of County Hall to try it, put some sensors in, and then we were shocked when it went 25 miles to Great Yarmouth and we had that connectivity. So it clearly had something there and we got involved with the local local community and found that actually they were using the Things Network because it was easy. They, they were saying they would use it if, if we kept it free. So uh, we built the case and worked with the LEP on the project at that point. So yes, it is using the Things Network and the reason we're doing that is because we want to keep it free and we want it to be simple to use. Now in the future, we may choose Use as we develop more and more into the smart county that we want to be to replace some of the gateways if we get additional funding so we can have a private network for public and a public network or we may do a bit of both um, but there are more just more and more opportunities and more and more ways to use it but the things network makes it easy to use OK, so if we uh, wrap up there, I know Kurt, you might want to have a, um, a quick revisit of where to go if you've got any more questions and then we can post the link 
uh, that people might be able to join if they've got any more detail answers that they want that we can start the team's meeting in um, five minutes time or so. Yeah, so so just to recap, so we're, we're putting a network out there. It's about uh, kickstart and innovation in Norfolk and Suffolk. If you want to get in contact with us to find out more or ask questions, um, if you if you email in at norfolk.gov.uk if you're a Norfolk business or in at suffolk.gov.uk if you're a, a business in Suffolk or you can join the Norfolk and Suffolk Restart Festival which is on the 30th of September um, where we'll be there talking about the, the network in more detail. Um, in, in October we'll have an event about use cases so you can see the things we're already working on and the things we, uh, we've got an ambition to work on which are happening really quickly and then we're going to look at technology in November and share how to get the basics up and running to help people. Of, of course you can also go to the NCC website, the Ben Burgess website or the Unitech website to find out more because they're the people who've been in the videos who are really doing it. You know, it's happening now. It's not something we're talking about the future. It's happening now. And there's some other case studies there on the slides. The slides and videos will be available, but I will absolutely thank everyone for coming to find out about the network. And Martin, I think you've got to post a link to, to so you can join if you choose to join us informally to have a, a, a chat about the network in five minutes time. Yep, just posted that. So it's a long link because we can't do hyperlinks in the in the um, in the announcements there. But that's a link posted to a, a meeting, a Teams meeting that we can join uh, and discuss any questions that you've got in a bit more detail with tonight's presenters. And um, so that pretty much wraps us up. So we'll uh, we'll have a finish there. Um, so thanks for attending. I know we've had well over 100 people. Um, so. Uh, we appreciate you giving up your out of work hours in order to find out about Lorawan. So we'll finish the session there. And if you want to ask any questions and join that team's meeting in about five minutes, you could speak to Kurt or Michael or any one of our presenters this evening. Um, so thanks for attending and good evening. <laughs>